formerly now, uh, Dr. Hana Yagi. She uh, received her PhD in Environmental Health Science and Policy here at UC Irvine in 2006. And she's currently a community outreach and environmental education specialist with the, Washington, the state of Washington's Department of Ecology. This is equivalent to the state's environmental protection agency. Uh, she has been recognized for her work in promoting community involvement in toxic cleanup sites. One of her major projects is helping to develop an innovative cleanup strategy for Washington's largest cleanup site. We have a lot in California to learn from the state of Washington and how they do this, uh, but she's uh, been able to teach also at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, where she was an undergraduate also in environmental policy. So today she's going to tell us not to eat dirt. There's an <laughs> environmental health word for that. It's geophagy, which some people do because of cultural issues, but uh, how we convince them that the risks are uh, far away, the benefits is part of the job of the public health advocate. So uh, particularly she'll focus on environmental you know, partnerships uh, around the different uh, offices in the state uh, department. So thank you very much, Anna. And uh, we will uh, interrupt with questions if you, yeah, if you don't do. mind, but yeah. we can also say the nitpicky things for the end. Great. Thank okay. you, Deli. And thanks, everyone, for having me here. It's really good to get out of the state agency environment and into an academic environment. Um, we're facing a pretty big state budget crisis in Washington, not as bad as California, but there's a lot of pressure to do more with less. And that doesn't leave a lot of time for staff to take the time to sit back and reflect on the work that we do. And so it's really nice to be in this environment. And I'm actually going to use you for your feedback. And I genuinely do want your feedback. You know, every time I speak to a group, whether it's just general public stakeholders, an academic um, environment, a classroom, I get all kinds of different feedback. It's actually quite useful because this is kind of a new frontier for environmental protection. Is, um, doing more partnerships with public health. Um, so I'm going to talk more later on in my um, presentation about why you shouldn't eat the dirt. Um, and I'll, I'm trying to move away from PowerPoints with just text. So this is going to be mostly visuals. Um, so I'm going to do a quick introduction to the state of Washington. Has anyone been to Washington? Yeah, a few people. Seattle, mostly? Yeah. Okay. It was very sunny when I went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an interesting fact about Washington is that at least Tacoma and Seattle don't get any more rain than most major American cities, except for maybe California cities. So it's it's just it just feels gray. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Um, so a little introduction to the state of Washington, and then focusing on the toxics cleanup process because that's my area of expertise. And then the toxics cleanup process kind of feeds into. Um, a lot of our work with public health agencies, and so I'll talk about how environmental health and public health agencies work together. Um, and then my best case study is the Dirt Alert program, and um, I'll introduce, I'll give you all the background, more, more dirt than you wanted to know about. And then at the end, we're going to do a focus group exercise, so I'm going to need some audience participation for this, and I actually am going to be using this information. It's, something, it's a process that we're going to be starting in Washington that you're going to be the first guinea pigs for. <laughs> so does anyone know what the largest mountain is in Washington State? Rainier. Rainier, yes. Uh, 14,000 feet. Towers over Tacoma where I live. You can see it from Olympia where the state capital is, the work near Olympia. It goes from basically sea level to 14,000 feet in about 40 miles. It's pretty dramatic. Does anyone recognize this part of Washington from a famous series of stories and movies? <laughs> Do the popular books and movies right now? Oh. Uh. <laughs> what is? Twilight. Twilight. <laughs> so this is uh, the La Push area, the beach where uh, I think Bella goes in the first movie. Um, and she jumps off a cliff in the second movie somewhere around this area. 
Um, this is the Washington coast. It's um, actually the longest protected stretch of coastline on the west coast. Uh, it's part of the Olympic National Park. Um, there's a trail that you can hike along the beach for 17 miles and you never see a building or yeah, any sign of civilization. Um, but it really just kind of embodies to me what Washington is about. It's a progressive state that really values its environment. Uh, although I'd have to say that's more true for Western Washington, and I'll show you in the map of Washington how, how the state is very divided. So I, I have not seen any vampires in Britain. <laughs> it's, it's pretty bizarre how many thousands of people come here. And this is the city of Tacoma, and I just wanted to point out Tacoma because I live there and we're very proud of our city. But it's also a really good example of what the state has been able to do in terms of environmental cleanup. Tacoma um, was basically founded on the timber industry. The uh, Northern Pacific Railroad terminus was located in Tacoma in the 1880s. A huge port city grew up around um, Commencement Bay. And with all that industry, there was a lot of contamination. Basically, the entire Commencement Bay area is filled with cleanup sites. And one of the things that the state was able to do was give about $30 million to clean up the waterfront area. And you can kind of see part of it. The waterfront runs under this bridge and then further out, it's a couple miles long. And this weird looking cone here is the Museum of Glass in, in uh, Tacoma. And I don't know if you guys have heard of Chihuly, but he came from Tacoma and grew up there. Um, and so now we have a museum of glass that features a lot of his work and he sends his artists there and this is actually a, a hot shop inside so people are blowing glass in there. But this was made possible because environmental cleanup happened first. A toxic cleanup site um, was finished and then they were able to do redevelopment. This brick building right here was an old grain mill which was redeveloped into condos. So this has kind of happened all along the waterfront in Tacoma. And then just up from the waterfront, the University of Washington, Tacoma, um, the campus is only about 20 years old. And what they did was they took a bunch of old warehouse buildings and redeveloped them into the campus. So they were able to fill in a part of downtown that really was pretty deserted and unused. The land was cheap. They had to do some cleanup as well. There are a lot of uh, leaking underground storage tanks they had to deal with. But in the process of doing that, they really revitalized the downtown area. Um, and then you just have a bunch of beautiful architecture in Tacoma. This is a high school, if you can believe it. It was built as a hotel around 1900. Um, part of it was destroyed by fire. The hotel never opened. And the school district bought the building for pretty cheap and then turned it into a high school. So it's a stadium high school. It's been in a number of movies. Yeah, sure. Um, did they, was this um, Brownsfield redevelopment projects? Or? Yeah, so we consider this a brownfield redevelopment project. There's a really, actually I'm going to a conference um, in a couple of days on brownfields redevelopment. It was actually a big, you know, kind of a nationally recognized example of a big, big brownfield redevelopment project that really kind of turned around the city. Um, and actually, technically, EPA doesn't consider this a brownfield redevelopment because it's too close to Commencement Bay, which is a Superfund site. It's actually one of the nation's first Superfund sites. So, by definition, you can't have you can't get brownfields funding for something that's already adjacent to a Superfund site. But we we consider this in the state a, a very very successful brownfield development. And then this is our old city hall. So I love Tacoma, a lot of great architecture, a lot of great little neighborhoods. And then this is Washington State. So I talked about Western Washington being different from Eastern Washington. The Cascade Mountain Range really kind of divides the state, um, you know, environmentally, politically, everything's quite different on either side of the state. Um, and what I wanted to do was show you a few areas of the state and how our state's history has kind of led to the current environmental health problems that we're dealing with and that give us all a Department of Ecology a job. So that's Tacoma right there. And Tacoma, I said, was built pretty much around industry, railroad and port. This is Port of Tacoma. There's actually quite a few ports in Washington. Port of Tacoma is one of the largest ports in the country, actually, in terms of the volumes they do. And this is 
great for the region, but it's also led to a lot of environmental problems with all the development in the port area. Um, basically, there was a demand for land, so it was the uh, tide lands were filled in to create artificial land to build the port on, and that destroyed a lot of really critical habitat. Mountain Bay used to be a great place for migrating birds to stop. Um, there are a lot of uh, salmon species that use Mountain Bay um, before they swim up river to spawn, and that you know the development of the port really destroyed that environment. And then there's been a lot of toxic contamination. So we're trying to undo 100 years of work to destroy the environment. This is the Seattle Everett area. Um, I just wanted to point out this area because. Boeing is probably, it's a little hard to see, but it's inside one of Boeing's huge facilities. Boeing's one of our important industries in Washington. Um, and they also have a number of our worst toxic cleanup sites. So we're very proud of our aviation history, but Boeing actually um, costs state taxpayers quite a bit of money because they're trying to clean up a number of their sites. They use a lot of chemicals and jet fuels and solvents that ended up in the ground and in our water. Um, this whole region of the state is kind of known for its forest products industry, and this is a picture of a pulp mill. So pulp mills take uh, wood and basically break down the fibers into pure cellulose, and then they use those fibers to make paper. Paper is probably the most common thing you think of as a company up in Bray Angeles that still makes telephone book paper. I think they supply most of the United States with telephone book paper. Probably a dying industry, but they are still optimistic. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, but pulp mills create a lot of contamination. Um, and one of our most complex cleanup sites that we're dealing with right now is a former pulp mill. So they not only emitted dioxins into the air, which are now spread throughout the city of Bray Angeles, but they also you know, up until the 70s, when we had water quality regulations, up until then, they just discharged all of their waste into the harbor, and they're producing a huge amount of pulp. So the whole harbor is pretty much contaminated with chemicals from their operations. Um, Eastern Washington is known for its apples. You probably have all eaten Washington apples. <laughs> Um, apples also represent a huge headache for Department of Ecology. Um, from about 1900 through the 1940s, uh, lead arsenate pesticides were the primary pesticide used on apple orchards and other fruit orchards. And lead arsenate pesticides, when they fall off the apples, off the trees to the ground, they don't disintegrate over time like organic pesticides do. They just stay in the soil. And what we've seen happen in eastern Washington is a lot of these old orchard lands have been redeveloped into housing developments. They become schools and child cares and parks. Um, and no one really realized that there is an issue with lead and arsenic in the soil. And so um, we're now just starting to tackle this issue. What are we going to do with thousands and thousands of acres that are contaminated that are now people's homes? Um, and then I'll point out one other area right here in the middle of the state. This is along the Columbia River. Um, it's a little hard to see here, but this is a server farm. Uh, Google and Microsoft both have huge data centers in central Washington. And they locate it out here because there's cheap hydroelectric power and there's a lot of land and people didn't really care that they built these, you know, several hundred thousand square foot warehouses to store all their servers. So. When you're Google searching, you may think that there is no environmental impact and you're just on your computer, but your Google searches are running through this huge, huge data center. And there's a really big issue because with all these data centers clustered around this little town in central Washington, um, if the power system goes down, they're relying on diesel backup generators and they do have to use these if the power goes down because they have to be constantly running the servers. And what they found in the town of Quincy is that if all the diesel generators are running at the same time, that produces a really high health risk to the community in terms of particulate emissions. And so it's just interesting places where you would never expect to have an environmental health issue where you know, in people just go out and build these giant data centers thinking you know, it's not going to have any kind of impact. There are impacts that we don't 
we don't realize until they happen. So that's a little overview of Washington. And the population is yeah, mostly population. on the west? Oh, yeah. So around Puget Sound is where our largest population is. There's actually a city. So Portland is just south of the Washington-Oregon border. And there's a city called Vancouver on the other side of the river from Portland. It's another area where we have a lot of cleanup sites because there's a large population. Yeah, but most of the population, besides Spokane, Spokane's kind of like on this side of the state. Uh, most of the population's in western Washington. Um, and actually, this, this illustrates it well because these are toxic cleanup sites. They cluster around areas of um, high population. So Spokane is right here. Tacoma, Seattle area. This is Bellingham up here. Um, so this is our universe of cleanup sites. They're active cleanup sites. This doesn't include any of our storage tanks that we regulate because then the whole map would be red. Um, but this just kind of shows you the volume of work that we're dealing with in Washington. And my program has about probably 150 employees right now. And so our goal is to get these sites cleaned up um, hopefully faster than our average cleanup time of 13 years. But uh, we're working under a really progressive, stringent toxics cleanup law. It's, I think, one of the best cleanup laws in the country. Um, it's called the Model Toxics Control Act, and it was actually passed by voter initiative, which is pretty unusual for this type of regulation. It's a highly technical regulation. But voters passed, they had a choice between different versions of this law, and the one they chose was the one that had the largest public involvement requirements. So they wanted the public to be able to be involved, communities to have a say at every step in the cleanup process from when you first discover a site until it's done being cleaned up. And so it's a pretty, it's a pretty unusual situation in Washington. And it, it strictly defines the cleanup process. You cannot deviate from this cleanup process, although within the cleanup process there's a lot of flexibility in terms of what you can do um, to get the site cleaned up. And I have some slides that will illustrate this better, but I just wanted to run through the basic process. So we start out with site discovery. And in Washington, we have a lot of citizen complaints. People like to talk to their government in Washington. They are not apathetic. Um, Luckily, we're able to respond to a lot of complaints. You know, someone will call up and say, ah, my neighbor's burning trash in their yard, you know, stop them. And we can't, we don't have the authority to go out and stop them, but we can, there's, there's ways we can deal with it. Uh, but in many cases, we get calls about, you know, people that have been dumping toxic chemicals or they suspect it's toxic chemicals, and we can go out and investigate and see if dumping hasn't occurred. We get calls from whistleblowers from companies who have, um, you know, un unsafe practices where they're dumping chemicals they shouldn't be dumping into waterways or into the ground. So we actually get a lot of our sites through citizen complaints and from the local level. Um, then we have to go in and do an initial investigation, something we call a site hazard assessment. You actually have to verify that there's contamination and get a sense for what, what chemicals are out there and what the human health risk might be. And you need to get enough information to name a liable party. So everything hinges, or a lot of things hinge, on having a liable party, someone to pay for the cleanup, who's legally responsible. So once we get a liable party under a legal agreement to do cleanup, then we launch into the remedial investigation and feasibility study. I hate this. I hate this term. It's just impossible to explain to the public. I hate putting it in fact sheets. Um, basically, what we're looking for is for the liable party to define the full extent of contamination and the nature of contamination, and then to look at what um, cleanup options are most feasible. And that's after they pick the cleanup option, they write a plan that sets out what they're going to do to get the site cleaned up. They go through the cleanup process, and then at the end, we like to check in to see if the cleanup actually worked. Um, and then we have interim actions, which are basically just partial cleanups that you can do earlier on in the process. Um, and the cases where we do these are where there's a more immediate public health risk. Um, we might go in and, and make the liable party do cleanup earlier on, because this process takes a long time. If I, re if yeah. I remember correctly, for the federal uh, Superfund oh, yeah. program, the identification of the liable party was 
so contentious that many lawyers mm -hmm. were involved. And is, is it the same here, or is it typically straightforward because it is smaller scale? Yeah, it's as though I planted this question oh, sorry. with you. No, no, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, another big difference with the Model Toxics Control Act versus EPA's process is that we have what we call joint and several liability. So once we name a liable party, they are fully responsible for the entire cleanup. If we name more than one liable party, they are both fully responsible for the cleanup, and they have to apportion liability between themselves. So that battle gets taken out of our court and it goes to, you know, it has to go between the liable parties. So we, we say, you're both liable, you're gonna do cleanup on this schedule, and they have to figure out how that's gonna happen. So it, it saved us a lot in terms of our attorney resources. I think that sounds great. Where's the team? Who enforces that? Um, so we, awesome. yeah, so the state has um, kind of different levels of enforcement power. Typically we try to enter into what's called an agreed order, which is kind of the most cooperative type of legal instrument you can have. And a lot of live parties, actually the vast majority, do end up going into an agreed order. And without any kind of threats from the Department of Ecology, they go ahead and do the cleanup. Um, in a large part, that's driven by often a need to sell the property. You know, an industry's gone out of business. They want to unload the property. They can't do that until it's cleaned up. Um, or there's community pressures, or a local government has offered to buy a property once it's cleaned up. Um, then we have something called a consent decree, and that actually settles liability in the state. Um, so with a consent decree, that usually happens later on in the cleanup process, but um, that's a more legally binding document and basically a liable parties agreeing that they will see the cleanup all the way through the end in exchange for the state never bothering them about that site again. And then we have enforcement orders where we can force companies to, or liable parties to go out and do cleanup and the penalty there is uh, what we call trouble damages. So if we have to spend any money on the cleanup, then we charge them back three times what it costs us. So that's that's a pretty good that's a pretty good threat. We need to use it. So there there is there is some teeth in Washington at least. Um, so I'll just run quickly through the cleanup process again, identifying the problem. In a lot of cases, you have a very very obvious problem. We have photos in Tacoma's library of all of these chemical industries out on the tight plants. So we're pretty sure that uh, business practices back in the turn of the century were not great, and people were actually dumping uh, leftover chemicals directly into the bay of this industry. In some cases, it's a little bit more difficult to identify a problem. You're dealing with a mom and pop grocery store gas station type business, and there you have to go in and figure out if maybe their underground storage tanks are leaking. But in some cases, it's pretty obvious that we're gonna have a cleanup problem. Um, in the investigation process, so when you're investigating contamination, you basically are kind of building a case that there is a contamination issue that needs to be cleaned up and that you are identifying a liable party. So you do things like take photos and take environmental samples. Yeah, Sherry? Now remind me again, why do you use this new one you set up rather than the one that's established the federal, the environmental slide assessment the phase one, two, three? Because you think it's gonna be faster? Because mm -hmm. it's basically, it's almost identical. Yeah, the idea was that it would be faster, I think, it ended up, you know, on average, our sites get cleaned up just a little bit faster than super fun sites. I forget. Well, what this, that's fun. not even for a super fun site. Yeah. But that's just for oh, yeah. what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It's just for any time when to produce the property oh, to demonstrate oh, yeah, yeah. that there's. Yeah, yeah. Phase one assessment. So if you're buying a property, a phase one assessment is basically going back through the paperwork for a property and seeing, you know, what the history of the property was. Um, and that's generally done on a, on a private level, so a, a purchaser-buyer agreement. You would go in as a purchaser and do your due diligence, basically, to make sure that you're buying a contaminated site. And then phase two is where you actually would go out and take samples. Um, but places where there isn't a transaction happening or there's nothing else to push the cleanup process along, the state will go in and do this process. So we kind of we pay up through the initial investigation site hazard assessment phase. And then we build up enough information to, you know, get someone to pay for the cleanup. Well, you Does probably have more control too if it's state yeah. rather than federal. Yeah, yeah. You know what 
samples you're taking yeah. and you're pretty sure if there's an issue. Yeah. Does this happen on the other end as well? Like if a developer comes in and wants to build, I know there's an like environmental impact report, but how does that process happen with development? Yeah, so if a developer's coming in, they'll do a phase one, and if they, for instance, find that there is a chemical industry that was located on the property, then they go straight to a phase two where they're actually going out and taking samples and looking for evidence of contamination. So, so they do that on their own, and then, you know, there's a couple different options. You can go through the state's formal process. There's also a voluntary cleanup program. So if you identify an issue on your own and it's not too, too complicated, you can run the cleanup process yourself. Hire an environmental consultant and do the cleanup yourself. So it's, it's But once it's question. identified, it's up to that Someone. group to, to resolve it before they can build. Yeah, yeah. Or buy to build. Yeah. Yeah. And and if you go ahead and build anyway, then you just run the risk that you may have to tear down some of what you built and do the cleanup. So yeah. If you can actually find um, a particular party or you know, maybe the party's not, you know, exist anymore, but actually cause contamination. Does the state just go ahead and pay for it, or does it sit on Yeah, we have a fund to do cleanup of orphan and abandoned sites, um, and that, you know, our funding fluctuates from year to year, so we have a list of sites that we prioritize for, yeah, state-funded cleanup. What sort of percentage is that of the total sites? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't know, maybe five to ten percent of the total sites yeah yeah and sometimes we just have a recalcitrant liable party who you know we just decide it's better to do clean up on our own so we front the money for it and then we try to recover the rifs um something i try to do is create easy to read diagrams i've been experimenting with graphics programs to <laughs> show some pretty complicated concepts in simple terms. So a remedial investigation, basically you're looking at aerial extent of contamination. So across the property, if you're just to look at the surface, how far does contamination go? So if we're looking at something like dioxins from air emissions, those are generally found in the top three inches of soil. If you're just looking at, you know, across town of Port Angeles, where are dioxins in soil? But in cases where you have contamination that could potentially be deeper, you want to look the vertical extent of contamination too. So you're doing borings down into the soil. You're monitoring groundwater. A lot of contaminants end up in groundwater, the more mobile ones, things like petroleum, petroleum products, petroleum related chemicals, um, solvents, a lot of those end up in groundwater. So you want to make sure that you don't have contamination in groundwater that's either going out to a larger body of water or potentially is feeding a well system. You really, really hope that you're not, yeah, you don't have contamination in drinking water wells. So that's the basic idea behind a remedial investigation, the aerial extent and then the vertical extent of contamination. And then with the feasibility study, you are looking at, well, given the nature of this contamination, what are the best cleanup methods to use? And I'll walk through some of those cleanup methods. And this is the standard chemical site again, um, about 100 years later. Um, so when we think about cleanup, we often think about just removing contamination, physically removing it from the environment. Um, this is a bunch of wood waste and I think construction debris mixed with all kinds of chemicals. And this is being pulled out of an area of pretty wet soil. There's, it's right on a waterway, so there's soil and then kind of a transition in the intertidal area and then there's sediments that were contaminated too. Um, and actually this shows it even better. So, they managed to contaminate everything, the ground that the company sat on, and then all the sediments offshore. So this is a sheet pile wall built to hold in all the contamination that might get stirred up through the sediment cleanup, and then um, they basically dredged, using this clamshell, dredged down all the contaminated sediments, landfilled them, um, they dug up a lot of soil, landfilled it, and then brought in clean fill. So that's kind of one of the standard ways you would do cleanup is just removing the contamination and backfilling it with something clean. Another major method for doing cleanup is containment. Um, so containing contamination in place. It's an interesting method because you can't always get communities, especially next door neighbors, to be on board with containing contamination in place. It's not a pop, uh, 
publicly popular idea, but sometimes it's the only thing you can do. This is an old landfill, um, and essentially the landfill was built before landfill regulations specifically said you have to have a liner around your landfill. And what was happening was um, there's a lot of metal contamination in the landfill, and uh, arsenic was leaching out into a wetland right next door. And so what happened was the company responsible for the landfill dug a giant trench all the way around the landfill and poured bentonite clay to form a slurry wall. So bentonite clay is, you can pump it in in kind of a, kind of a liquid form, but it forms a pretty complete impermeable barrier around the landfill. So containment's one way to do it, and then you cap over the landfill with a impermeable liner, and then they covered it over with soil. And the neighbors aren't thrilled, but you know, yeah, or you could build a park or a golf course on top. And that's actually, yeah, you do redevelopment at the end, hopefully. Um, and a great way we found to get communities and local governments on board with cleanup is to promote the idea that you can reuse land that formerly was just sitting there unused. And this is again the Tacoma waterfront, that museum of glass cone, a uh, bunch of condos that were built on a contaminated site. I forget what industries were sitting down here, but there was basically industry lining the entire waterway and it all had to be cleaned up. Um, and then with redevelopment and cleanup, you have uh, institutional controls. And this idea is really important to how um, public health agencies get involved in the cleanup process. Institutional controls, um, can be as simple as just going back and checking to make sure that a landfill liner is still working. But sometimes we have more complicated institutional controls. So where you can't actually complete cleanup because of some sort of technical um, issue, and sometimes it could be the size of the site. The um, example I'm going to talk about in a few minutes is the Dirt Alert program, which deals with area-wide arsenic and light contamination from a former smelter and that's a thousand square mile site. So there are technical barriers to actually getting cleanup. In that case, we use what we call institutional controls, other methods of ensuring that the public is protected. Um, and that's, it's actually a pretty big component of cleanup and we're starting to explore that a lot more as a state. It's written into our cleanup law, but typically we've been dealing with these sites that are pretty small and manageable where you can actually remove all the contamination um, and you don't have to worry about public health issues or environmental health issues afterwards. So institutional controls are a really important part of the cleanup process we're finding. So how do we interface with public health agencies? This is where it hopefully becomes a lot more relevant to what you guys are doing. Um, so the way it's structured in Washington State, at the state level we have Department of Ecology, so we deal with environmental protection, and then we have Department of Health, and we collaborate a fair amount on cleanup sites and other um, environmental uh, quality issues. Um, and then at the local level, local governments don't have statutory authority over the cleanup process, but they do play a really important role. Um, they often will provide funding for cleanup or they will purchase a contaminated site to make it easier to get the cleanup done. Um, so they might take the liability away from another liable party and then we find it's a lot easier in some cases to work with the local government because they're interested in getting a site cleaned up fast and getting it redeveloped. Um, and then again on the health side, Department of Health, we work a lot with them, but they also delegate much of their authority to the local county health departments. And I think the structure is the same in California, you have State Department of Health and then you have the county health departments they really do the majority, the vast majority of the on-the-ground work. Um, and with County Health, we always work with the Environmental Health Division of whatever County Health Department we're working with. And in Washington, they get a lot of their funding from Department of Ecology to do these site hazard assessments. That's that initial investigation phase in the cleanup process. Um, so they get involved right from the start. They often know communities, well, they always know communities a lot better than the state does. Um, they know what some other concerns might be in the community. They know about the neighborhood where the contamination issue is. They know, they often have a better relationship with the local government. So we have them go in and do that initial portion. 
And then they have the health promotion role in, especially in working with institutional controls. So places where we can't do cleanup and we need to implement some sort of public health measures to protect human health, that's where we bring in the health. I have a couple questions for you guys to make you wake up and do some work. Um, risk communication is a really important part of the work that we do and something we rely on public health agencies quite a bit for um, because that's generally their um, area of expertise. And I love asking this question to different groups because I always get a slightly different set of answers. Um, and I wanted to ask this question because we're not always aware of all the different ways that toxic cleanup sites can impact communities. And I just like to kind of hear a brainstorm, like throw out whatever you think about this response. How, how do cleanup sites impact communities? If, if this was in your backyard, how would you be impacted? Health issues. Mm -hmm. Visual health issues. Mm -hmm. Like what kinds of health issues? Um, Right, so if there's lead dust sitting on the surface of contaminated sites blowing across the fence into your yard, your kids may be exposed, there could be direct health impacts. Anyone else? Other ideas? It makes a big impact on just the education of what actual exposure can be. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, just, you don't always think what would be coming out of a smokestack. So you're saying it makes communities more sensitive to other I mean, issues. If you're getting sick, you know, you may not correlate it with anything in your surroundings. But once you draw those two lines together, people become a lot more aware of their surroundings. Yeah. I would think it would affect a lot of health behavior as well. Like, um, like we just moved to a really heavily polluted area, and I don't like running anymore, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. So knowing that there's a heavy amount of smog in the air, and much less it might impede like economic development like other industry or companies coming in and, and growing their business there because they might be more savvy and know they don't want to put business there uh -huh. yeah that's always the risky running anyone else yeah i think there was a community that had to close um close to my like whole housing houses that had to be approved because it was on a landfill and i think it's that question of why didn't anyone tell us and what effects do we have. So it's almost like a disempowering experience and stuff um, because luckily someone caught it or they had huge clusters of disease, but yeah, it's it just kind of like, okay, now I get to move and I don't know how I'm going to be affected by this in the long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in a lot of cases we're discovering cleanup sites after there's already a community built around it and it's very disempowering to people to have this issue emerge after they've already moved in. Yeah. I, I apologize if I miss uh, repeat what somebody else said. Oh. <laughs> I had trouble hearing some of the things that are happening. But, but perhaps there may be some economic uh, disruption, such as if this toxic site results in less bees or less birds, and then my crops are not able to be pollinated, and so I have less apples to, to sell. I mean, the, those sorts of changes in the biology and the biological yeah. diversity. Yeah, true. Yeah, and that might be true for eastern Washington, the huge areas of orchard lands that are contaminated. And we don't know a whole lot about that. That's, yeah, the biological impacts are, yeah, that, see, that's something I hadn't really thought about. So, real estate value goes down. Yeah, real estate value. That's a question you get a lot. You know, how is this going to impact my ability to sell my home later? I, I don't want you to take samples of my property because I don't want to know. <laughs> a lot of people say. <laughs> yeah, it's sad. And then this is a, I put up the sign, it's a warning not to fish. This, a lot of commencement bay in Tacoma, um, we have these signs up, you're not supposed to collect shellfish or fish in these areas because they're contaminated enough that it's not healthy. And we have a lot of populations, uh, Russian, Ukrainian, um, Southeast Asian populations who actually subsistence fish out of commencement bay. and. So we have a lot of languages translated down here at the bottom. 
another question for the audience. So given that the average cleanup site takes 13 years in Washington, what can you do from a public health perspective to protect communities while that cleanup is happening or while it may be stalled out? This is a pretty open-ended question. You have to think creatively. talked about those impacts, yeah. Maybe educating people living around the area about how to reduce their exposure to whatever contaminant is there. Yeah, yeah, so how you can reduce your exposure. What are some ideas about how you can reduce your exposure? So what if your yard is contaminated with lead and arsenic? Don't have your kid playing the yard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, <laughs> We hate to tell people to do that, especially in Washington where it's so hard to get outdoors in the winter, but um, what are some alternatives to just not playing outside? Park. Yeah, that's nice. Okay. Yeah, if you know your park is clean. Yeah. Are there certain kinds of um, plants or things that people can plant or do to the soil to help facilitate improving the soil? Yeah, we, we actually looked at this for lead and arsenic in soil. There's a kind of fern, the Chinese break fern uh, uptakes arsenic, but what we found is that it doesn't do well in the environment in Washington. It's a little bit too cold. Um, yeah, so that's that's one thing you could do. Another issue we ran into is that where we were able to grow the ferns, um, we found that they actually qualified as hazardous waste after they had taken up the arsenic and lead. So then you have this whole disposal issue, issue to deal with, but actually, Doing something in your own yard, as we'll talk about with the Dirt Alert program, is a way to reduce exposure. So there's things that you could do that you would normally do in the process of landscaping your yard. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, in some cases, you know, public health actually gets involved anytime you have a water contamination issue. So one of the ways you could be impacted by a nearby contaminated site is through um, pollution of your drinking drinking water source. Um, in that case, we always bring in public health because they deal, they regulate um, drinking water quality and they are a lot more qualified to speak to people about those risks and do things like um, install filters or figure out a different water source. So there's a lot of places where public health can really come in and, and make a pretty big difference and really reduce risks. Yeah. Is there a tendency to create like I don't want to say case studies, but like, do you publicize the cleanup and send it to other businesses and then don't let this happen to you kind of thing? Or, or how? how hmm. not, not our program directly. Yeah. We, have, um, we have a program where inspectors go out to businesses who are currently under, um, in many cases, water, like water discharge or waste discharge regulations, and they they kind of, yeah, use that as a reason to comply with state regulations because you don't want to have a cleanup site down the road or you don't want to be fined. In a lot of cases, it wouldn't probably lead to having a cleanup site, but yeah, where, where we can, we try to promote the idea that you want know, to do something up front to avoid a problem down the road. Um, so I said I would talk about partnerships, more about how we work with um, Department of Health and local health agencies. And if we go back to that cleanup process, um, there's a couple of ways that health is involved. So local health, I said, we give them funding to do that initial investigation and site hazard assessment process. Um, so they're involved right from the start. And those are more um, environmental science type staff who work on that, uh, that type of work. During the remedial investigation process, we are looking for how the environment is being impacted. We're also looking for human health risks. And if we think there's a potential for human health risk, then we give our data to Depart State Department of Health. And they do what's called a health consultation or a technical memo that basically advises us um, as to what we should do to address human health risks. And so sometimes it can be, um, you know, we, we've been doing a lot of work on cleaning up Puget Sound. We've done a number of studies of different invasions around Puget Sound. So we collect a bunch of sediment data, we give that to the Department of Health, they tell us if they think that people should still be harvesting shellfish from those bays, or if kids are going to be at risk if they're playing on the beach. Um, so they 
give us their opinion and then it's up to us or us working with Department of Health or local health to put up signs, put a ban on fishing or shellfish collection, or sometimes this drives us to take more immediate measures. So we do an emergency action, we could do an emergency removal action, so we remove a huge portion of the contamination before we've gone through any of the other processes just because we know it poses large human health risk. Or we move to interim actions, those partial cleanups that deal with the biggest risks first. So the Department of Health is really important and then local health is really important for risk communication because they know their communities better. We often partner with them, give them funding or give them the resources to work directly with communities to explain the cleanup process, to talk about how communities might be at risk. Um, and that factors into those early actions that we do. Um, and it also factors into the cleanup planning process itself. Um, we want to be we want to be sure that when the public is involved in the decision about what cleanup method is going to be used, that they're informed about the risks and they're able to um, give input about how this cleanup is going to affect them physically and mentally. And then local health, um, I said, is involved in institutional controls. So those sites where um, there's something additional that needs to be done at the end of the cleanup or where we can't clean up the whole site, we get local health involved and they have a lot of resources, they have a lot of messages and tools that they already use to do other types of health promotion that we can apply to clean up sites and they also have great uh, resources for doing evaluation. That's something that we don't typically do at Department of Ecology. We don't do a whole lot of evaluation but we're finding the more we rely on um, public health messages, the more we need to do evaluation to make sure that those are actually an adequate measure for uh, doing cleanup. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a case study. I mentioned the city of Vancouver, which is just across the river from Portland, Oregon. Um, there was a company here called Cadet Heater, Cadet Heater Company. Um, if anyone's seen those little wall heaters, they just heat one room at a time. It's kind of like installed in your wall, it has a little tiny grate. Cadet makes those heaters. Um, and they used trichloroethylene, uh, TCE, to degrease the metal uh, heater parts before they painted them. And TCE is pretty toxic. We dumped it straight into the ground, as was standard practice for many decades. Um, and just thought, you know, out of sight, out of mind. We dumped it into the ground, we don't have to deal with it again. What ended up happening was that it went all the way down into the groundwater. And once TCE was in the groundwater, it spread out of this industrial area and into a neighborhood. This is a residential neighborhood here. And the residential neighborhood, actually, they got their drinking water from a different source. But what was happening was that TCE and its breakdown products, which include things like dichloroethylene and vinyl chloride, um, those volatilize really easily so they can turn into gas. They come out of the liquid phase in groundwater, turn into gas, and move up through pores in the soil. And if that happens under your house, it can collect in the crawl space or your basement and pose a health risk through inhalation. Um, so Department of Health was called in. As, typically, as soon as we know that there is solvents in groundwater and it's sitting beneath the neighborhood, we call in Department of Health to do an evaluation of risk. So they look at concentrations in groundwater, they estimate how much is going into a gas phase and how much is making it up into houses, basements, or crawl spaces. And then from there, they figure out um, what your risk is if you're living in that home. And as you can imagine, people were really upset in that neighborhood. Um, it's something you don't have a lot of control over. It's very disempowering to know that these gases are coming up through your home and potentially your health is at risk. And so luckily what we're able to do is install soil vapor extraction systems, basically just a fan that blows out the contamination, filters it out, and then discharges the clean air back into the environment. But it was really important to have Department of Health there. So they did things like explains to the community, you know, if you have dry cleaning in your home, that's actually emitting more, higher concentrations of TCE and its breakdown products um, and perchloroethylene than you're actually getting 
from that groundwater exposure. So they were there to kind of set the context. It's a little bit tricky making comparisons with you know voluntary risks because people choose to get their clothes dry cleaned or not. Um, but it was helpful for actually the people who came to the series of public meetings we did. I think were comforted by the fact that you know this is not out of an ordinary exposure, out of the normal range of exposures. Um, so it was good to educate the community, but also to alleviate their concern and then to be able to do something about it. Who paid for the vacuum filter? Uh, the Port of Vancouver owns the, the, the property. The property now, yeah. Um, so this is my big case to the Drew Alert Partner. Just wondering how much time they have left. Yeah. Okay. So this is the old Asarco smelter in North Tacoma, and it was a copper smelter, so they took ores and heated them up to high temperatures and extracted copper, but also arsenic. Um, and this, pay attention to the height of the stack, it's about 570 feet. The stack was actually the cause of a huge problem. The neighborhood complained because the stack that they used to have um, basically emitted all all the emissions directly into the neighborhood, so they built a higher stack for PR reasons. Um, and as you'll see, that created a bigger problem. Um, so this is molten rock, um, where they're extracting the copper, and then they also extracted arsenic. And I mentioned the lead arsenic pesticides in eastern Washington. Asarco was actually the main supplier of arsenic for those lead arsenic pesticides, which is just an interesting fact. So I said that stack is 570 feet tall. What that meant was, and this is North Tacoma, so the smelter was right in there. What that meant was that instead of just that neighborhood um, having heavy metal emissions in their soils, we get this entire plume area. So we call this the Tacoma Smelter Plume. It's a thousand square miles. Um, not every property within here is contaminated, but we think that any property within this boundary could be contaminated. Um, and just to give you some context, if you were to overlay this, kind of in a, rotate it and overlay it over the LA Basin, um, this would run from about Irvine up through about Van Nuys, and it would cover a large portion of the LA Basin. So if you can imagine a major part of the LA Basin being contaminated with lead and arsenic, this is what we're dealing with in Washington. And it is kind of mind-boggling. How do we deal with this issue? And then the purple areas in here, what we did to try to start narrowing down where we should focus, those purple areas are um, statistically where we calculated the highest probability of finding arsenic over 100 parts per million. 100 parts per million is pretty high. Um, our cleanup level is 20 parts per million. So we're looking at really the, the most serious areas. And this is how we're going to try to focus in our work. Another few words about Asarco is a company town. This um, town of Ruston grew up around the company. There are a lot of people who still live in this town, whose parents or grandparents work for Asarco, who have a great deal of loyalty. I mean, they basically built this portion of Tacoma. Um, it was a family who owned the company for a while. I think a lot of these guys are related. Um, and in recent years, um, once we discovered that there was a huge, this huge plume of contamination, um, we decided we were going to go after Asarco, and shortly after that, they went into bankruptcy. Um, their parent company is called Grupo Mexico. Grupo Mexico owns a lot of international companies. And what they did was when they bought Asarco, they bought um, all of these uh, smelter facilities around the U.S. and around the world and a bunch of mines. And what they did was they sold off all of the mines, which were the really valuable piece of the company. Everything left is the smelter facilities, which have a lot of environmental liabilities attached to them. So when they went into bankruptcy, um, we weren't sure that we were going to get a dime out of the Sarco. But luckily, um, another company stepped in to try to buy Sarco, and then their parent company ended up putting in another bid. Long story short is that um, it ended up being the largest environmental settlement in the country. Um, Twelve states and EPA got a total of about $1.6 billion from the Sarco. And the state of Washington got $188 million. And about 90, 94 million of that is going to go towards cleaning up the Tacoma smelter plume. 
So, um, just a quick note about the way the site was divided up. This is actually a development that's going in on the super fun portion of the site. It gets more complicated. So, EPA originally identified that this former smelter would be a clean, uh, super fun cleanup site. They knew that because smelter sites typically have very high contamination around them. So they identified one square mile area in North Tacoma that they're going to consider their super fun site. And so they poured a bunch of resources into that cleanup. A developer purchased the property itself and is now doing cleanup as they redevelop. Um, but EPA didn't think that there's any contamination outside of that one square mile. Logically, there had to have been, but they decided it was easier just to deal with one square mile. So the state is picking up all of the work for that, the rest of the plan. So the facility itself hopefully will someday look like this really nice waterfront living, but everything else um, the state is dealing with. Turned out kind of funny. Um, so this is kind of a rough schematic of the plume if we consider this purple area from the map, the areas where we expect to find arsenic over 100 parts per million. Um, with the settlement that we got, we're going to be doing <laughs> residential <laughs> soil cleanup. <laughs> so that's where we're going to use those physical cleanup methods. Um, typically we go in and remove the soil contamination or cover it over um, and put landscaping on top. Everything outside of that purple zone um, if it's a child use area, so a park, a school, a daycare, um, we also reserve funding to deal with those. Um, and then everything outside of child use areas, outside of the high zone, that's where we're relying on education and outreach, institutional controls. So we are basically going to be saying to the public, we can't actually go in and clean up your yard. You're going to have to rely on yourselves to protect your own health and protect your children but we're gonna give you some tools. And the way we're gonna do that is um, Department of Ecology gives funding to three health departments. So yeah, Pierce County, King County, and Thurston County are all within the plume. And what they do is they provide services. Um, and this is for the general public. They do things like mass media advertising. Um, they also target children, parents, teachers, um, and daycare providers. Um, through trainings for teachers, daycare providers, and through direct mailings or advertising to parents. Um, they're also targeting um, people who own properties, who garden in their yards, um, teaching them to protect themselves with their gardening. Uh, public health departments do a great job of reaching ethnic communities where there are cultural barriers to doing what we would like communities to do and on English-speaking populations. We have a lot of, um, we have a Korean population within the plume, some Spanish-speaking populations, some Somali populations. And then low-income housing is another place we're looking. There's a lot of low-income housing within the plume area. So one more question for the audience. Um, so what actions do you think we would be asking people to do to protect themselves? So what would be part of our education and outreach campaign? So one of the responses earlier was, don't let your kids play outside. <laughs> but what are some things you could do? Medical screening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, blood lead screening. Um, the county health departments do that. What are some simple simple behavioral changes that you could do? Yeah. Can you just wash your hands a lot? Yes, very good. <laughs> wash your hands, that's the number one message that the health departments use, in part because that's a message they use for just about every program they do. Communicable disease, um, any kind of toxic contamination, wash your hands. Anything else? Yeah. Don't grow food crops. Yeah, or grow them in garden boxes. Yeah, we recommend people grow or build garden boxes and import soil where they, they know the source of the soil. There's another really big one that we tell people to do that's really hard. I, I think probably, I know in Southern California a lot of people do this anyway. Yeah. Take your shoes off. Take your shoes off. Take your shoes off or use a doormat. Washington is a little different culture. Some 
some communities, this um, Russian community and Ukrainian community, you know, we did some focus groups with them. They said, oh, we always take our shoes off. Why would, why would we not? But a lot of people don't take their shoes off. And that's a, that's a big um, risk factor because a lot of the exposure will happen in the home through dust and soil that's trapped inside, especially for kids who are playing on the floor. So I have a couple more minutes. I'm going to do a really quick, um, maybe five minute focus group. <laughs> and I'm just going to put this out there to you guys. I actually brought some materials that I'm going to pass around. These are what we actually use to do our education and outreach. So I'm passing around a damp dusting cloth and meal brush. And we also have some door hangers and brochures. So I want you to take a look at these things and think about what would make you be more aware of this issue. What would get you to pay attention to the jury alert message? If you're a kid, you probably love those nail brushes. Kids flock to those nail brushes. <laughs> and they use them. It's really interesting. We've gotten some good anecdotal feedback that kids use the nail brushes. The damp dusting clause, another message we have is that you should be doing damp dusting, not using a feather duster, because that stirs up any contamination that's in the dust in your house. So use these cloths, get them wet, wring them out, and use those to dust instead. Yes, another question. What would actually get you to change your behavior? So how many people take off their shoes when they go into their home? Most people. How many people wash their hands every time they come home from being outside for every meal. Ooh, pretty good. So I wish I could take you guys to Washington <laughs> and feel a lot better about the job that we're doing. A lot of people, well, okay, here's another question. How many of you vacuum your house every day? <laughs> no one, no one. That's that's actually a message that the, our local health departments came up with to vacuum your home every day. And realistically, we expect that people maybe do it a couple of times a week or once a week. But um, they actually do a vacuum loan program where people can loan out these vacuums that show you, they have the red light, green light to show you when you're actually done vacuuming a carpet, when all, all the dust is out of the carpet. And the idea there is to show people that you can accumulate dirt and dust in your carpet on a daily basis. Um, so that's something that's really hard to change. Do, yeah. Do you ever yeah. tell uh, people about the diseases that might be associated with these exposures? Because fear yeah. may be a mm -hmm. strong motivator for behavior. Yeah. Um, we do have some messages about yeah, the health impacts, especially the lead, because this meshes with a lot of local health departments' uh, lead programs, too. Um, but in a lot of cases, we get people who are maybe overly freaked out about the health impacts. So we have really have to balance that message, getting people concerned, but also taking them down off a ledge. Yeah, so you are not going to die if you live anywhere in the place. And I wanted to ask you guys, this is the, this is the question that's kind of um, what we're going to start exploring um, in Washington. Can education and outreach be a substitute for cleanup? And we're looking more at the you know, ethical and moral issues here. Um, we have resource constraints with cleaning up the Tacoma Smelter Plume, but we still want to explore the idea, how do you how do you communicate to a community that you're not going to go in and deal with this contamination? It's our responsibility as a state, but we're going to have to say to some people, you're going to have to change your own behaviors. And I'm kind of curious what your initial reactions are about using that as a cleanup method, just doing education and outreach. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just also thought, I feel like that might be really effective, partially because like if you invested in a home, you're going to be very committed to making sure it's a safe environment for your family, and maybe more so than you would trust somebody else if you, if you know how to do it, if you have the resources to clean it up yourself. Right, if you have the resources. Yeah. 
you working with like community groups to like figure ways that they can help with cleanup? I mean, that might mm -hmm. empower them a little bit yeah. more than just changing their day to day habits. Mm -hmm. And that's something we've kind of we've looked at with ethnic communities, but we haven't figured out a good way. I'm kind of curious what are some good ways to. Yeah, partner with community groups or types seems, of community groups. That might be seems good. like, because um, I do outreach and for research study, um, faith-based networks are really good place to start. But with faith-based, it's about relationship building. You can't just go in and say, you know, we want this from you. You have to identify like the components that will develop a relationship over time. Like, why should they trust you or you know believe you? So you have to kind of do a bi-directionality of giving back and, and maintaining and sustaining a relationship. But that's where people will usually listen the most that I, I've had experience. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, with the Slavic community, we had to go in and work with the church because that was kind of the only way to get people's trust, but we haven't explored that with other communities. Yeah. Is it possible to kind of spin this, not spin it, but create an opportunity for economic development. So let's say that if you're trying to say, don't be putting your vegetables, you know, we want you to be growing your own vegetables, that's a wonderful thing, eat healthy. Is it possible for the cleanup effort to perhaps work with the community to get, provide an opportunity for someone to be building these, uh -huh. these above ground container, you know, places? Or if, it's, if I'm not vacuuming in my house every day, because perhaps it's because I'm working all day, is there a way for the cleanup effort to work with the community to come up with uh, employment opportunities for people who will provide those services to the community? So, I don't know. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I mean, something, this isn't exactly what you're talking about, but. You know, something we've looked at doing is working with landscapers, you know, just first and foremost to make sure they're protecting themselves because landscapers working within the highest contaminated areas of the plume are probably at a pretty significant risk, but also working with them to, you know, when they're doing their work to do things that um, cover over contaminated soil. I and mean, one of our big messages also is cover over bare patches of dirt in your yard, bring in compost or topsoil to cover over old old soils if you haven't done anything to your yard. But yeah, maybe partnering with people who are working in in the home or people's gardens. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's uh, I think the word substitute there is going to be very problematic because I would think that the state is saying we're not going to clean up. It's up to me to protect myself. And I think you have a lot of problem with people like me wanting, because it's like some, something there, you can't forget that the soil is contaminated permanently. So you want to give some hope that eventually the, the soil will be cleaned up, but maybe for now um, there are things I can do to protect myself. Because I don't want to live under the threat that there's always something out there. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, if we were to get huge tax revenues over the next 10 years, we might expand our cleanup areas. No, yeah. that's a good point. Yeah, but, yeah, but it, it would get maybe a lot of environmental activists who will object to passing up the responsibility mm -hmm. for individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I had a point. I mean, I think, I think that's really important. And I think what could help with that is not leaving a community feeling like they're being abandoned. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sorry, we can't do this. Right. Um, you guys, you know, need to focus on this. You guys need to, you know, change in this way. Um, but to say, okay, we can't do this for this and this reason, but we're here and we're going to continue to be here through the entire process. And so build a partnership, but beyond just building a partnership, is also building presence within the community. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, with the federal government, they have Rebecca, which is risk-based um, actions. Mm -hmm. And um, what, you know that it gets more expensive the less concentrated. Right. The more you clean it up, the more expensive it is to remove what's there. So what you could do is, I, mean, I don't know, but have 
slightly reduced cleanup standards that you're trying to achieve and have this um, behavioral, mm -hmm. these behavioral changes. So it's sort of this a real team effort that you're doing cleaning as much as you can with the money you have, but that they have to contribute part of the, um, to the health protection as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have something that kind of fits that model. Um, one of the county health departments, actually Pierce County, which is where Tacoma is, they basically said for, you know, a portion of the plume, it's not the entire plume in Pierce County, but for a portion of that population, they'll do free soil sampling, and they're not doing enough to actually characterize your property. So it's not enough to do cleanup per se, but it gives people a sense of what's in their yard and, and hopefully gets them to take take action on their own. So yeah, something like that, we could at least pay for the sampling. It's something we're running into is once you get out to the outer fringes of this purple area, your chances of finding properties that need to be cleaned up, yeah, keeps going down and you spend a larger portion of your funding on, on soil sampling. But well, that's sort of what the risk space is also, yeah. that you, you target the areas that are the highest concentration in where the people live or where the um, housing developments, not industrial areas, and then you clean those high risk areas first, but instead of cleaning them down to, let's say your cleanup group, the drinking water, or the groundwater, but it actually isn't even used for drinking water there. Mm -hmm. But you clean it up, maybe not to benzene five parts per million or TCE, no, well, TCE five parts per million. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't clean it up to that. Maybe you leave it at 10 or 15. Mm -hmm. And that would save you possibly millions. Yeah. yeah. Is somebody keeping track of like the yeah, so they're they're tracking it and we're not we have a database for tracking all our formal cleanup sites where the state is overseeing cleanup and so we don't we don't include the county's work in that overall database because it's not you know characterizing it well enough to do cleanup, but they're they're tracking it. Hopefully someday we're gonna set up a database that lists out every parcel within the plume and where we can track, we can kind of click, check off parcel by parcel as we're able to clean up. You know, that, you know, information is another big tool that we're gonna need to make available for communities. You know, if you're buying a home, it'll be good to know, did someone already do cleanup or is the state gonna be coming in in the next few years and getting cleanup? Yeah. Is, there, is there land that isn't yet developed? Because if you had like state-owned land and you could incentivize a developer to come in and either give them tax and tax credits or land at a really cheap cost, then maybe they would pay for cleanup of certain areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. There is actually a lot of undeveloped land. Um, so on clean land, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to clean that land. Too. Yeah, bash on. Vashon and Mori Island here among the heaviest contaminated areas and they also have a lot of undeveloped land and a lot of people are going in there and building housing developments, turning agricultural land into housing developments and so that's one area where we'd like to work with the county who does the permitting for developments to ensure that people are doing sampling and cleanup while they develop and that's a really interesting issue because we're dealing with so many different jurisdictions. The like city of Tacoma is pretty progressive. They're already asking people to do sampling and cleanup, but they don't really have the authority to do it. So they really need for the state to take the lead on requiring sampling and cleanup. But some other cities don't want to do that. They don't want to hinder development. So it's going to be interesting trying to get everyone on board with a kind of a universal policy on how we deal with contaminants. Yeah. Of course, even if the land were cheap, you still have, they're still going to leverage it, they're still going to have to borrow, and then you have problems with the lender culpability. Yeah. And the, the lenders may even be the most um, resistant to wanting to lend money on something that could turn into, change from like a 50 million to a billion dollar cleanup. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. yeah. Unless there's some kind of protection, and that's of course is what Brownfield kind of does. It helps with that. I think for the last question, I would just say, like if this was me, I would want to know if my behavioral substitution would actually do anything in the sense of like, am I just putting a bandaid on or is it actually stopping me from getting exposure? So I think it would be important to communicate 
somehow like your exactly how much am I lowering the risk by doing this behavior? It's so, really yeah, it's a really yeah, because idea. it's like I'll wear you know I'll go vacuum like I'll go vacuum my floors, but that's really going to keep me from getting lead poisoning. Or is that just like, here, this might be a good idea, but we're not sure. <laughs> great, great. Yeah, so. quantifying, quantifying the risk. Yeah, yeah, that's something we probably do need to work on. I think that's going to be an interesting process to try to assess the risk. Well, thanks, everyone, for your Thank feedback. You.